Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'll start today by letting you know who we are and what we're doing at this session. My name is Lissa Radke. I'm the Community Development Educator for UW Extension in Ashland County. Our speaker today is Nicole Abbott. Nicole is a food scientist and advanced licensing specialist at the Wisconsin Department of Agriculture, Trade and Consumer Protection, or DATCAP. Nicole has over two years of experience with DATCAP and over 20 years of experience in her food safety career. Nicole says she's passionate about food safety. As a licensing specialist, she provides people with the information they need to safely start and maintain their food-related business. And when she's not at work, Nicole enjoys hiking with their children, especially on the trails and the parks near where she lives in her hometown of Berlin, Wisconsin. We'll bring Nicole on in just a moment to tell us about our topic, which is food safety in Wisconsin, licensing for your mobile food business. Today's webinar for food entrepreneurs and farm-based food businesses is brought to you by the Food Entrepreneurship Ecosystem Development Initiative, or we shorten that to the FEED Initiative, which is part of UW-Madison Extension's Community Food Service Program. We're a statewide extension program that fosters equitable, resilient, and sustainable community food system development using research, evaluation, project-based partnerships, and outreach programs like this one. FEED has two major educational projects in the year. First is our online webinar series for food and farming businesses in the spring, which is what we've been offering every month every Monday this month. And we also offer a two-day summit for food and farming businesses in person in the fall. And I invite you to please consider joining us at our fall summit, which will be held this year in October in Milwaukee. There'll be a lot more information on that in our website coming up. A quick bit of housekeeping here. I'd like to make a request that you all complete our short session evaluation. Your anonymous feedback helps to keep programs like this low cost, and your input helps us improve our future programs. So please see the link in the chat and fill out our short survey before the end of the program. Lastly, we do encourage interaction from you today especially during the question and answer part of the webinar at the end of the speaker's presentation. So just feel free to put your questions in the chat box at any time, and we'll get to them during the Q&A. You can open that chat box by clicking the chat icon at the bottom center of your Zoom screen. And now I'm pleased to turn the program over to Nicole Abbott to share information about today's topic. Welcome, Nicole. Thank you. Okay, um, can everyone see my slides? Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay, um, so today we're going to talk about licensing for your mobile food business. So at DATCAP, our mission and vision. Our mission is we partner with all the citizens of Wisconsin to grow the economy by promoting quality food, healthy plants and animals, sound use of land and water resources and fair marketplace. Our vision, we deliver efficient and effective programs and services to Wisconsin agriculture consumers and businesses to provide market confidence and to enhance competitiveness and profitability. Um, our um, food uh, mission is ensuring a safe food, lodging and recreation by educating and regulating business in a fair, effective and efficient manner. Uh, Wisconsin is a national leader in supporting the growth and safe operation of diverse food, lodging, and recreational businesses. 
I am part, I'm Nicole Abbott. I'm part of our food scientist licensing specialist team. Um, I'm the one in the middle. There's my phone number. My colleagues are Mark Lehman and Charles Bloom. Um, so if you want, you can email any of us or email the licensing uh, mailbox, which will be shared with you later. So we have some statutes that impact our food program. Um, the one we're gonna focus today is retail food. So there are some products that are retail exempt. Um, so there's two criteria. If everything is prepackaged from a pre-approved source, an approved source, and there is no processing, and nothing is potentially hazardous, which means nothing needs refrigeration or to be kept frozen for food safety. Um, Raw agricultural produce does not need to be licensed if you're only selling that. Um, then you may have heard of the pickle bill. Um, so what it covers is pickled fruits and vegetables, sauerkraut, salsas, chutneys, jams and jellies, and applesauce. And those can only be sold at community or social events such as bazaars or farmers market. And you can sell no more than $5,000 worth of product. And those products need to be labeled. You can also give out samples uh, without a license. So if there's no sale, no license is required. Um, and meal items need to be in bite-sized portions. You can also sell apple cider, maple syrup, and honey without a license, um, if it's your own maple syrup, honey, and apple cider. Um, Nonprofit exemptions have some, um, there's some exemptions. Um, so for product items that are not meals, such as bakery, drinks, and confections, no license, is required of 12 or fewer days in a licensing year. So we recommend you follow transient event stand fact sheets rules to protect the public, but you would not need a license if you're a nonprofit organization and um, selling these items for less than 12 days in a year. For meal items, however, it would be three days or less. Um, so examples of this would be like sandwiches, um, ready to eat meat items, um, fried vegetables, um, such as fries. So what if a process and a product requires a license? So there's two parts to every license, the operator and licensee and the facility. Licenses are not transferable. If one of these two things change, a new license is required. Um, so in the case of mobile, for example, um, if you had a food truck and you sold it to someone else, they would need a, li a different license. Or let's say you had your food truck and you decided to get a different food truck or a different base then you would need a new license. Um, so some different types of uh, food establishments. Uh, there's a retail food establishment serving meals, such as a fast food restaurant, supper club, or diner. Um, then some are retail food establishment not serving meals, such as a grocery store, retail meat shop, or a bakery. Um, then there are the transient licenses. So these are the licenses um, such as farmers markets um, or for serving meals, um, burger stand at a circus, um, a nonprofit brat stand, 
a barbecue tent at a musical festival or transient retail food establishment not serving meals, such as a kettle corn roaster at a holiday event, ice cream stands at a car show, or fried donuts at the county fair. Um, then there's mobile retail food establishments, which we're going to talk about more in depth. Um, so for serving meals, a barbecue food truck, a hot dog push cart, a sandwich truck. Um, for not serving meals, an ice cream push cart, a coffee cart or trailer, or a cotton candy push cart. Um, for push carts, um, push carts that serve or prepare non-TCS foods um, are not limited on what they can sell. Um, so as we'll talk about, push carts um, have slightly different um, rules. Um, so you could have a push cart that has items that don't need to be refrigerated um, or frozen. Um, then there's push carts that serve TCS foods, and those are limited to activities using preformed meats as far as grilling. Um, you can also use them for hot hold and cold hold items as well. Um, so for a service base, a mobile retail facilities um, are required to have a service space unless a variance is issued. Um, so locations could include a retail base license, um, which should be meals or no meals matching the truck license, um, a retail license and same ownership and a license level sufficient to support truck, no additional license needed. So that would be if you would own a restaurant and would also have a food truck and your restaurant is the base. Um, then you would not have to pay the base license fee. Um, you could also have a food warehouse as your base if you're only storing product there and having a cleaning facility. Um, mobile food establishments must return to their base at least every 24 hours. Uh, so they're meant to be moved. You can't just set up in a parking lot. Um, so a variance for no service space. Uh, we do not offer the variance during initial contact. Operators are responsible for completing the paperwork for a variance. Um, here's where you would send the variance to our retail team and they have up to 30 days to evaluate. Um, so if you plan on getting a variance, be sure to allow extra time. Um, one thing that mobile uh, retail establishments require is water and wastewater tank requirements. Um, there must be a single gravity or pressurized storage tank on the um, unit and it shall have a gauge to read water, volume in gallons or liters. So a five gallon tank capacity is required for push carts for hand washing. So um, that's one of the requirements of push carts that's a little bit more lenient. Um, a 10 gallon tank capacity is required for hand washing uh, for units that only serve beverages or prepare food or reheat prepared food. Um, and for that, you would also have to have a dishwasher or sink at your base for washing your dishes. Um, for the 40 gallon tank, it's needed if it's required for hand washing, food preparation, and or utensil washing. So those would be units that you would be able to prepare food and wash your utensils and dishes. Uh, the wastewater tank must be at least 15% larger than the water tank. 
Um, some important things for construction for the food truck is the driver's compartment must be separated by a partition from the food prep, storage, and service. Um, Self-contained units must have walls that protect food from contamination sources and be cleanable, durable, and non-absorbent. The floors must be vinyl, linoleum, or similar finish for self-contained units. The push carts, um, you would have them on asphalt or concrete, um, not grass or other um, surfaces. Um, they must have overhead protection or be covered. Um, you can't just have them um, open aired uh, for push carts, you often see umbrellas for that protection. Uh, the food contact surfaces must be non-toxic, smooth, and easily cleanable. Uh, for the equipment and utensils uh, that you would be using um, under our requirements, equipment and utensils must be certified by ANSI. So that's a uh, organization that has requirements. Um, and then the certifying group. So what you would look for on your food equipment would be these symbols um, for NSF, Intertech, Underwriters Labs, um, Canadian Standards Association, um, the Baking Industry Sanitation Standards Committee. Um, so be looking for this um, on your refrigerators, your sinks, your cooking equipment, any major equipment. Um, another thing for your mobile food business that's important um, is employee health. Um, so food service employees must not have any open cuts, sores, or diseases. Um, specifically, if you have fever, diarrhea, vomiting, jaundice, sore throat with a fever or a lesion containing pus or a boil or infected wound, um, you may not be involved in the preparation of serving food. Uh, if a food service employee has been diagnosed with an illness uh, transmittable by direct contact or contact with food, he or she is not permitted to work at all. Um, so unfortunately, if it's just you and you're sick, you can't go out that day. You can't be serving food and exposing people um, to illness. Um, another important thing is hand washing. Um, so that's why you have a sink and plenty of water. Um, for hand washing, you need to remove any jewelry. Um, use soap, um, not hand sanitizer. Every once in a while, people ask us, well, can't we just use hand sanitizer instead of a sink? The answer is no, your hands need to be washed with soap. Um, then you need to rub your hands together, um, use a fingernail brush, um, wash with warm water, and also use single uh, use paper towels to dry your hands. Um, so that will be, you'll need to have all of this available um, at your food, your mobile establishment uh, for hand washing. Um, so when to wash. Um, so there's a lot of examples there. So basically you're washing your hands a lot of the time. <laughs> um, so before you even start uh, working with the food utensils or equipment, uh, before you put on gloves. Um, so your hands need to be clean before you put on gloves. Um, that's always the first step. Um, during food preparation or as often as needing, needed when you change a task, such as switching between raw foods and ready to eat foods. 
if you handle any soiled utensils and equipment, if you cough, sneeze, or use a tissue, uh, if you're eating, drinking, or using tobacco products, after you touch your skin, face, or hair, if you handle any animals, um, I don't know if anyone would be having um, aquariums or anything like that on their food truck, um, but if you do, you need to wash your hands. Um, if you use the toilet, you need to wash your hands. Um, and really anything that can, could contaminate your hands, if you're on your cell phone, um, even after you're handling money, you need to wash your hands. Um, as far as eating, drinking, or using tobacco, um, you can't do that where you could contaminate exposed food, clean equipment, utensils and linen, unwrap single service or single use articles. Um, so for many food trucks, um, that would mean you would need to step away from the food truck um, to be eating, drinking, and smoking so you're not contaminating your food and utensils. Um, if you have ready-to-eat foods, you need to use gloves. Um, so bare hand contact is not allowed with ready-to-eat foods. Um, like fresh fruits and vegetables, cold meats and cheeses, breads, ice, ice garnishes. Um, so be sure you properly wash your hands before you put on your gloves. Um, it is allowed for product, a bare hand contact is allowed for products that would be fully cooked. Um, so like if you would be making pizzas or handling food before you cook it, um, that's fine. Um, but anything that's ready to eat um, that will go to the consumer, you need to be wearing gloves. Uh, food must be from approved sources. So it must be obtained from sources that comply with the law. So that means being from a licensed facility. Um, for me, it means like a Wisconsin estab meat establishment or USDA plant. Um, you can't actually use food from out of state or meat from out of state, excuse me. Um, for, so for example, you can't uh, use retail food from Minnesota or Illinois, um, you know, from the meat counter, for example, um, meat has to be labeled. Um, and no food prepared in private home, including pickle bill items or home baked goods. Um, so we've talked about how you could use or sell those without a license. Um, however, uh, let's say you have a hot dog stand you made some pickles um, that would be a pickle bill item, you can't actually put them on the sandwich. It has to be from licensed facilities. Um, then you can also not use foods that are prepared on other transient or mobile units. Um, for example, let's say um, you have your food truck, um, maybe you have food, two food trucks, um, and you're running it and you have some employees or family members um, running the other one, um, and they make, I don't know, say a fried dessert item, they can't bring it over to your stand so you can sell it there as well. Um, for food safety, time and temperature control is very important. Um, so you might hear the term TCS foods. Um, so that means time temperature control to limit pathogen growth or toxin formation. Um, so that includes animal foods that are raw or heat treated, um, raw seed sprouts, leafy greens, 
cut tomatoes. Um, they have to be held um, at temperature. Um, so you do have products that have um, AW means water activity, um, pH values that require it. Um, so that's a, a table of things. Um, where you might see that would be um, sauces, for example. Um, like you have some sauces that need to be refrigerated um, and other sauces that might not be because they have low water activity um, or low pH or both. Okay, um, so um, part of temperature control is cooking time. Um, so if you need to, um, if you're going to be cooking an item, um, you need to be sure to cook it to the right temperature. Um, so if you have plant foods that will be hot held for service, um, they need to be maintained at 135 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, it doesn't need to hit that temperature for a specific amount of time. Um, they would just need to be maintained. Um, then you have your roast. So that would be 145 for four minutes. Um, then you can see uh, the others as well. Um, poultry, um, would require the highest temperature, which would be 165 for at least 15 seconds. Um, and then here's some more examples of temperature control. Um, so when you hear um, cold holding or refrigeration, um, what we want is 41 degrees Fahrenheit or under. Um, if it's a frozen item, it must remain frozen um, for hot holding. Um, so if you keep things in a warmer, that would be 135 or above. Uh, if you do cooling, um, let's say you're cooking some soup um, and then you're going to cool it down to be served later, um, within two hours it has to be go from 135 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And within a total of six hours, 135 Fahrenheit to 41 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and then if it would be an item that would be at room temperature, let's say you opened up um, or some sauce, um, you mix some ingredients together and now you're putting it in the refrigerator, it has to be at 41 within four hours. Um, so this is very important. Um, so if you have refrigeration um, on your truck and you're doing cooling, make sure uh, you have it in a, a container that and refrigerator that's capable of this cooling. Some people assume that since they're sticking it in a refrigerator, it's going to uh, hit 41, you know, well before this time. But sometimes it does not, especially if it's together in a large container. Um, and then if you're reheating, all parts of the food reach 165 for 15 seconds. Um, if you're reheating it in a microwave, um, it needs to reach 165 and stand for two minutes after you stir or rotate it. Um, another important thing is date marking. Um, so refrigerated, ready to eat, time temperature controlled foods prepared on site um, or prepared by a food processing plant once you open that package. They must be consumed, sold, or discarded within seven days. The day of preparation and opening the container counts as day one. Um, and it's very important to avoid cross-contamination. 
Um, you want to separate your raw animal food steering storage preparation, holding and display um, from ready to eat foods, um, cooked ready to eat foods, uh, fruits and vegetables before they're washed and ensure raw foods um, such as beef, fish, lamb, pork and poultry are all separate. Uh, there are special processes and variances. Um, some examples of that are um, reduced oxygen uh, foods and fermentations. Um, usually those aren't done on mobile food trucks. Um, they're usually done at retail food establishments. Okay, um, so we'll go through our licensing process. Um, so for mobile retail, or actually any other retail, such as the retail food establishment or transient license, um, the location of the base determines the licensing agency. Um, so what we mean by that is in Wisconsin, some counties, are licensed by their local health departments and other counties are licensed um, by Wisconsin DATCAP. Um, but regardless of whether, wherever you get your license. Um, so let's say um, you get your license in Brown County. Um, and you're, but you're going to travel to other counties throughout the year. Uh, your license for the mobile would be recognized whatever county you go to. Uh, and the same is true about counties um, that are licensed by Wisconsin DATCAP. For example, if you get licensed in Door County, that's a Wisconsin DATCAP license. Um, but if you go to any other county, that license is also recognized. Um, so our license to get a license. Um, so right now, our license applications are not available online um, for the Wisconsin DATCAP um, licenses anyway. There are some counties that do provide their licenses online. Um, but regardless, if you go, come to us, um, we can refer you to other counties or we can provide you with applications and information um, on the facility requirements in addition to required training and certifications. Um, so once you complete your application, you'll return it with the license fee. So right now for Wisconsin DATCAP, you do have to mail that license with the fee through the mail. Uh, and then after it's processed, the inspector receives the application and schedules licensing inspection. Um, so then um, hopefully uh, you would pass and then it would be officially licensed or issue a conditional license. Um, so when we refer to a conditional license, what we mean is that there's something that you have to correct. Okay, um, some advice for applying is you want to contact DATCAP early in the process. Um, so when you know that you want to apply, be sure you're doing that right away. Um, for example, there's a lot of people that are applying all at once uh, for the summer season. Um, so you want to do that early um, because the inspector won't be able to get to you like next week. You have to be sure to do that ahead of time. Um, you want to understand and stay updated on the rules and regulations that apply to you. Um, so be sure that you're reviewing the regulations. Uh, we can help you, uh, but it should be after you review the regulations. Um, 
So ask questions. Um, you know, if you don't understand anything, we can help you. Okay, um, so now I can take some questions. Thanks, Nicole. That was really good. You gave us a lot of great ideas there. Many um, steps along the way, but you uh, laid them out really clearly in your last couple of slides. So um, thanks for that. We do have a couple of questions coming in and then a few clarifications on that process. Okay. Uh, first of all, um, our question was, if I'm replacing my old food truck with a new one, how long does that new license take to process? So I know how much downtime to allow in my process before I go out and try to sell. Okay. Um, well, one thing um, I don't believe that I mentioned in this. So if you have a new food truck, um, you know, that it hasn't been licensed in Wisconsin, you know, most recently, you'll need to go through a plan review. Um, so as as soon as you know that you're going to buy a new food truck or, or trailer, um, get us the plan the plan review information um, out and such so we can be reviewing that um, as well. Our licensing process usually takes um, we tell people a month probably at, I guess, peak season, it's, you know, closer to six weeks by the time you get the mail in the application and get the inspector out there. Um, so as we've mentioned, um, do it early. If your other food truck is still operational, you know, hopefully you can be still running with your current one and you'll be in the process of licensing your new one. Thanks. This, this next one is related to that. Um, in your process, you said have the uh, food truck or cart inspected. So that is by a DATCAP inspector that once I submit the application, someone from DATCAP comes out to my site and physically looks at the truck and makes sure that it's compliant? Um, yes. So with the stipulation, if you are in a county that DATCAP licenses, as we talked about some counties, um, such as Brown County um, and others, um, do their own licensing. But in any case, it is physically inspected. This was um, an earlier question. You might have already answered it, but is there a difference between a DATCAP license and a county license? So it sounds like in counties where we don't have a DATCAP inspector, you need to go to your county. Did you say the health department to get yes. a license? Okay. Yes. Um, so they should be equivalent licenses. Um. So they both follow the Wisconsin Food Code and ATCP 75, which is um, the legal regulation or the retail regulations uh, for retail. And you mentioned um, you inspect the truck at the beginning when you first issue a license at DATCAP, but I wonder, six months later, if someone's operating that truck or cart at the county fair, is there anyone who is inspecting the operations to make sure they're following all the requirements in their license agreement? Okay. Um, so you can be licensed at any time. Um, I believe the goal is every year. However, um, at some events, you will have inspectors there and they could be you know, technically like inspecting everyone. Um, so you should prepare to be inspected every time, you know, potentially. Um, but in reality, it probably won't be that often. Um, don't worry if for some reason you didn't get inspected. Um, you know, it it depends both on 
as I mentioned, you know, whether an inspector is at the event, um, whether they know you've been inspected within a certain amount of time, um, as well as general avail uh, avail yeah, availability um, of the inspector. Um, but uh, yeah, don't worry if for some reason you haven't been inspected uh, for a longer time. And um, I've been taking questions from the chat, but I'll take a quick break here and see if anybody wants to um, say their question for Nicole directly, which is an okay option. Nope, okay, we'll go back to the chat. Um, can family members serve food at my food truck if I'm sick and I'm the only operator, or do we need any additional licenses to cover that? Okay. Um, so you can have your family members be your employees. Um, you would want to do, you know, a, some training with them on food handling practices um rather than you know say call up someone that's you know completely untrained um but family members could be your employees that would probably be the easiest thing to do even if they aren't regular employees have them be your employees so they can step in and help they don't have to be part owners and I imagine uh, a couple of hours or two to go through all of the requirements that you just mentioned and make sure everybody's on the same page. Yeah. All right. Um, going back to our chat then, if I want to sell hot egg rolls at a farmer's market, what lic license would that be? Okay. Um, so you could get a transient license. So at the beginning of our presentation, we talked about some different types of licenses. And one of those types is transient license. And one of the main differences between transient licenses and the mobile license is that you only can make and sell food at special events such as farmers markets, fairs, community events, things that are considered special events. Um, so another point about that is with the transient license, you have to either make all your food at the event or also have a retail license um, to make the food at ahead of time you know, do prep work and such. And if anybody who has been asking questions needs to do some final, um, do some follow-up, feel free to raise your hand or speak your follow-up question and we'll get, we'll get back to you on that. Um, question for the chat is outside of running a food truck, but for home bakers, do you know if you need a seller's permit or what license would you need to do your home bake good business? Okay, um, so you can sell home baked goods at farmers markets and other community events um, directly to the consumers. Um, so you would not need a food license if they're um, non-TCS. So remember, we talked about the temperature control for food safety. Um, so what that means is uh, that you couldn't have things like cheesecake or creams or frostings that would make it to be something that needed to be refrigerated. Okay, and I think you already answered this, but if you were selling those home baked goods um, at a farmer's market, would you need a special license for that? No, um, and I should point out one thing. So remember we talked about not being able to sell home baked goods um, from the mobile establishment. Um, 
So if you would want to sell those items, the best thing to do would be to like get a, a separate table or something. So there's separation that people know that you're not selling them at your um, licensed establishment. And uh, what about catering? I assume that means, do I need a license if I want to do catering? Right. Okay. Um. So for catering, um, you could do, you would need a separate kitchen to do catering. Um. Now, do that. You mean from like a mobile food truck? Um. Oh. Here we go. Josh is doing some follow up um, for all site on preparation or all preparation on a site like a pig roast. If you are catering uh, a pig roast and you're doing all prep on site using USDA inspected meat. OK. Um, yes, you could do um, that sort of thing um, from your. Okay, from a licensed kitchen. Yep. Okay. I was going to say, yep, you want to have your licensed kitchen, uh, but then you could bring it um, on your mobile food truck uh, for a event. Okay, water. Okay, hook up. No mobile tanks. Okay. Um, so we do also have some different things um there's contract cooks um but generally those are um who you're doing the event for would buy buy the food um and then you would just make it um like for the pig roast um and then there could be private events where you act as a um contract cook or what's called a personal chef as well. So uh, these are, um, this is great specific information. And I just want to point out that Jessica has been putting some fantastic links in the chat box. If you haven't seen those yet for um, things such as uh, transient retail licenses, um, you can look at a previous recording that we had on the speed webinar this month. Um, and she's got a couple of other resources in the chat box. And I also want to mention that we'll put in a few more general contexts for DATCAP so you can find things on the website. We'll drop those in the chat before we leave. And also we'll email those links to everyone after this webinar um, in an email later this afternoon. And one quick housekeeping reminder um, that we would love to hear your um, feedback on our webinar today. So feel free to click our evaluation. It's anonymous, takes just a few moments and really helps us to keep the cost down for these programs and to help us deliver content and, and other programming ideas. So you're welcome to help us out with that. Um, I'm curious, in addition to DATCAP being the go-to source for resources to help us get our trucks on the road and out at the county fairs and the events, um, are there any food um, truck operators like an association or a place where people throughout the state um, gather together in conferences or workshops to help each other um, operate their food trucks safely? You heard of anything like that? Um, I'm not sure if there's a association or not. I could look into that. Um, I know that there's different like business development groups um, in different parts of the state, uh, but I'm not sure if there's anything statewide. And, and just in the bigger picture, I know I seem to be seeing more and more food trucks and carts up here in northern Wisconsin at community events. Are, are you seeing any trends in the number of licenses that you're um, approving throughout the state? Is this a growing industry or plateauing? What What's the big picture in Wisconsin? Um, I mean, I think food trucks are, are fairly popular. We 
get quite a few license inquiries, um, especially this time of year. Um, but usually, I mean, for food trucks, it's more of a long-term business. Um, you have transient licenses that people are only during, doing for the season. Um, but a lot of people invest a lot of money in their food trucks and they plan on uh, having it as a, a long-term business that they might even do throughout the year. And then um, an, another chat question was, I'm selling with a transient license at events. Um, if I'm preparing and cooking food at a commissary, would I still need a retail license? Okay, um, so you would need to have a license in your name. Um, so with that cap, um, we have the retail licensing. I'm not sure if some of the counties have a different type of license um, that's a little, you know, that's similar um, for when you're just going to take it to a, a transient event. Uh, but basically you would need a license under your your name or your business's name. Thank you. And nice. It looks like someone's found us a Facebook group for food truck operators. That's fun. Um, sometimes it's, you know, fun and supportive to find some peer-to-peer -peer learning where you're learning from others who are operating a business similar to yours. And um, I haven't clicked on that link, but it looks like Addison found a Facebook group that might be uh, other people who are in the food truck or cart business that you might want to network with. Um, thanks to Jessica, who's just given us some other resources for food trucks. Uh, as you can see in the chat, there's a nice link to a Dane County page that talks more about licensing and permits. Um, and if you're not in Dane County, not everything will apply to you, but it's probably a resource rich page for food truckers in, in general. Thanks Addison for giving us links to the Facebook pages. Um, another question coming in, can I prepare batter at home but make food in the food in the farmer's market. So you would have the raw materials assembled beforehand and then I guess cook it on site. Um, no, unfortunately you cannot do any food preparation at home. It needs to be in a licensed facility. Okay. Um, licensed under your your name, you know, your business's name the same ownership as um, the transient license or mobile license. All right, thank you. And um, Jay, you wanna ask your question? Yes, uh, what would be, a, for instance, that you would uh, give someone a variance to not, um, not have a mobile, I'm sorry, uh, a base, like, can you give a for instance where a base is not required? Okay. Um, so for example, um, some of the new food trucks are, are sophisticated, I, I guess. Um, I mean, generally you would need, need a base to at least empty your tanks and load on water. Um, but you could have a a food truck where you could do everything on the truck as far as food preparation and storage and cooking. Um, but maybe you're you're traveling throughout the state um, and you're only getting water and dumping the wastewater and you're constantly traveling throughout the state. So that would be, um an example of why you would not need a base um but obviously you know there's drawbacks you'd have to be 
buying your <laughs> food as you go, um, you know, and loading it directly onto your truck. You'd have to, um, you know, be able to clean the truck, um, mop the truck, store everything on the truck. We have a follow-up to that question about batter preparation beforehand. Um, this is, can I make batter on site if it's been properly cooled? Okay. Um, so like in the mobile a truck? It seems like it. But okay. Ellen, if you want to um, let us know if you have uh, more specifics on that, um, feel free to let us know. Okay, um, so if you would make it on site, you could, um, you know, refrigerate it, um, and then it would cool. Um, I don't know in this instance, you know, whether you would be, after you make it, whether it needs to sit refrigerated for a while, or whether you would be, um, you know, say, frying it or, or something, you know, fairly quickly. Thanks. And uh, thanks to everybody who's finding some Facebook um, groups for us to share some peer-to-peer -peer learning. I, I'd love to go see the uh, Central Wisconsin Mobile Food Bonetics. That that sounds like a, a spot you want to spend a few minutes on later this afternoon. Um, we're coming up right around three o'clock here. So I just want to see if there's any last uh, questions and remind you to click on the link to our anonymous survey to let us know what you thought of today's session and what you'd like to see in future sessions. Um, Ellen was talking about um, the, can you make batter on site for dipping um, into batter and frying it? And then um, looks like the last question uh, after we respond to um, Ellen's Last comment there that we'll take from Katie in just a moment. So if you want to um, do any follow-up, Nicole, on that um, comment by Ellen about dipping. Like dipping. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it, it seems like that. I don't know how quickly you're going to go through that batter, uh, but that might be a case of that you would have um, time as a public health control. Um, so that's one of the things you can do depending on um, the temperature of the product. You could keep your product, like say batter, um, out at uh, room temperature for say four hours as you're using it. All right, thank you. And our last uh, question today is for Katie. Yeah, hi, thanks. Um, I just wanted clarification on a comment earlier about having to have the commercial kitchen in your name. Like for instance, I have a mobile retail license. I sell fresh raw produce and vegetables. Uh, we're considering adding a um, like breakfast burrito. So it'd be a TCF food. Um, but if that is prepared in a commercial kitchen, like our church has a licensed commercial kitchen, I wouldn't be able to do that. Am I understanding that correctly? Because that kitchen is not in my name. Well, you could be licensed there. So we do have people that use, um, we call them shared facilities. So that could be someplace like a church or it could be um, one of these kitchens that's set up to be that way. Um, we have different organizations that license like several different small businesses um, and then other people come to arrangements with um, restaurants um, that where you could operate you know in your own little space or maybe a day or time that they're not operating there um, so you could be licensed at that location so you would get a food license there there would be an inspector uh, that would come out, but it would be limited scope into what you're doing, basically. 
Well, we're right at three o'clock. So I want to thank Nicole Abbott for bringing us so much information. I love all the great discussion and the questions. It makes me really excited for this summer's um, community events to see all the food truckers out there and know how much work it takes for you to go from your kitchen to serving us food at our special event. So thanks for that. Um, I want to remind you that next on this feed webinar series is our final webinar, which is scheduled for next Monday, April 29th, also at 2 p.m. And the topic for next week is strategic social media for your food or farming business. So that's a great way to end the series that we had this spring to talk about how to promote all the great work that you're doing in your local food businesses. So thanks for joining us, everybody. It was great to have you here and learn from you. And uh, we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.